Hello and welcome everyone. Well, we're going to be talking today about speeding up non-tubular fatigue design with automatic SCF extraction in SACS. And uh, to start off, I'd just like to briefly do a quick review of some fatigue theory just um, for a, a nice refresher on everyone's minds about what we're doing with fatigue. So uh, fatigue is essentially uh, where you have lots of cycles of uh, different stress ranges and uh, with initial defects in your connections you have cracks that propagate through the, uh, the connections and lead to fracture. Uh, we usually describe this using something called an SN curve where we have a allowed number of cycles for a given stress range and uh, damage can be expressed as a number of cycles that the, uh, the connection experiences versus the allowable number of cycles. In uh, something known as the Palm, Palmgren Miners Rule, uh, you can combine different stress ranges uh, with the, the following equation where you sum the number of cycles over the allowable number of cycles, and then equals the total damage for the connection. And uh, conversely, you can also describe this as a expected life by uh, dividing that damage by, or dividing the number of years by the damage. So um, those are just some basic terms that we use when we're talking about fatigue. And... Um, and that can help will help when we talk more about what we're doing with our stress concentration factors. So when we look at a particular welded joint, there are a few things that we need to consider. When you have a welded joint, you have what we know as stress concentrations. This is the increase in stress due to the geometry of the connection. Uh, where you have discontinuities, you typically have higher stresses, as can be seen here in this uh, tubular connection. We also can have small defects in the weld um, where the crack can initiate. And you can also see residual stresses uh, that occur due to the heating and cooling uh, from welding. So those last two items are taken care of by what we call the SN curve. And, but that first uh, item, the stress concentration factor, needs to be considered in some way, usually by applying a stress concentration factor. Uh, so here you know, we can say that the stress concentration factor increases the nominal stress to give us what we call hot spot stress, or the stress at a certain point in the connection due to the nominal stress. So if we look at a typical spectral wave fatigue analysis workflow, this, this should look pretty familiar to you if you've ever run a spectral fatigue analysis. Typically, for a fixed lake structure, we run PSI to linearize the foundations which gives us our pile super element. Then we'll run dyne pack uh, to do our modal extraction analysis, which gives us our mode shapes, our mass matrix, that can then be used in wave response to generate our transfer function and also our common solution file that has all of the uh, wave response results. We can then run fatigue with that common solution file to generate our fatigue results. But when we do that, we need to enter in all of our stress concentration factors for our given connections. There are a couple ways to do that. The first most familiar way probably for tubular connections is to use some sort of parametric equation. Uh, the most uh, common one in API is F the mu. The stress concentration factors are generated based upon the, uh, these equations uh, that take into account the geometry and give a estimated stress concentration factor. These parametric equations are typically generated from either real-world models or FEA models. 
and then our curve fit to give an approximate SCF. It's worth noting though that these SCFs are approximate. Another way that you can take care of these stress concentration factors is to mesh a connection uh, and then do the fatigue analysis with the mesh connection. Uh, in this case, we are actually getting the stresses for each individual plate when we do the fatigue analysis. Our common solution file contains the stresses in each plate uh, and then the fatigue is, is actually performed on the plates as opposed to the connection. Um, you don't even necessarily need um, stress concentration factors if you use a sufficiently small mesh. And here's an example of doing a toe analysis where we mesh a joint, then perform the toe in inertial loading analysis and the toe fatigue analysis. The downside of this approach is that while it does work well for any type of connection, uh, the connections take a long time with that many plates. And so um, most of the time people use a third approach for non-tubular connections, which is a uh, stress concentration factor approach based upon an FEA analysis. In this scenario, the uh, user will model the connection in an FEA analysis tool, perform uh, an SCF uh, extraction, which typically involves meshing the connection, taking stresses at certain locations away from the weld toe, and then extrapolating the stresses along the, the, those points to the weld toe. You'll see on this image that we have something called a notch stress and something called a hot spot stress. The notch stress is typically very, very high, approaching infinity uh, at the weld toe or in the event that the weld toe is not modeled at the connection and is unrealistic and uh, not useful for fatigue analyses. You'll end up with very, very high stress concentration factors and, and very, very low fatigue life, uh, which doesn't uh, model reality. Uh, typically, you're going to see welding, or sorry, not welding, um, yielding at that location, another phenomenon which will actually reduce the, the stress there. So these extraction methods uh, have been used to, to calculate that stress concentration factor. Uh, at, when SACS does this approach, we are using uh, the DNV RP C203 method for fatigue. Uh, stress concentration factor extraction. So revisiting our stress concentration factor workflow, um, we see, you know, we run our fatigue analysis, but uh, before our fatigue analysis, we're going to need to do something to get those joint SCFs. And a typical workflow for that will look like this, where you do your structural modeling of your beam elements and sacs, and either concurrently or after you're finished with your structural modeling, do a separate model of the joint in an FEA tool. Perform When you do your fatigue analysis, you'll get the SCF results from your FEA tool, but then you may need to do redesign, so you'll have to go back to the joint modeling, structural modeling, and repeat the process. So this can be a really lengthy procedure. It takes a lot of engineering hours. Um, some have reportedly said that this takes up to 25% of their detailed engineering design time doing fatigue and especially the FEA extract, uh, SCF extraction of the joints. So if we zoom in a bit on our spectral fatigue analysis, what we have added with this automatic SCF extraction is a more linear workflow where you perform your wave response analysis. You'll do your joint measure and post uh, analyses directly out of the SACS model. Do your SCF extraction, which generates your mesh OCI file and the mesh connection 
the post input file which contains the SCX, SCF extraction uh, input and the SCF extraction results and then input those stress concentration factors into your fatigue input file uh, to generate your fatigue results. The, if you haven't seen it before, the SACS joint mesh utility can automatically generate a finite element mesh based upon the beam model geometry. So you don't have to remodel the connection. The only thing that you might have to do is add some plate stiffeners or ring plates, that kind of thing, to add those non-modeled elements. But your tubular uh, braces and cords and your beam elements will all come in as meshed elements. And we have a variety of meshing options to help optimize that mesh. It's worth noting that any offsets or other types of uh, uh, modifications to your uh, beam elements will uh, carry through into the mesh as well. In our joint mesh utility now, if you click on a member brace and then look at the meshed member properties on the right hand side of the screen, you'll note that we have some new options. We have this create elements for fatigue and that's a yes no option which you can turn on. When you do that it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to add these options uh, for fatigue SCF extraction here uh, where you have a couple of different extrapolation options, a couple of different joint location options, and it's also going to generate some additional files whenever you mesh the joint. And I'm going to talk about each one of these options in the following slides. So for the stress concentration factor option, you have the option of either generating the mesh using the DNV recommended distances or your own user-defined distances. There are a few different ways in which you can extrapolate the mesh. As we saw, the extrapolation picks out those two points and then extrapolates along those, that line to the weld toe. So uh, if you pick different points, you can get slightly different hotspot stresses for this connection. So if you're using a different approach, you'll want to use your own user-defined distances. This, the extrapolation, sorry, the extrapolation method and then the joint location method. So the joint location option will allow you to either generate SCF extraction lines at all points along the connection or only at the hardline locations. So you'll see here with the all option that we have these extrapolation lines being generated on the cord and the brace all around this wide flange connection. Whereas on the hard line option, you will only see it at the web and the edges of the flanges. These hard lines uh, generally correspond to the SCF, uh, or sorry, the fatigue uh, analysis locations, which I'll cover in just a moment, but when you do this mesh, you also have the option to add additional manually defined hard lines, and those will have SCFs generated for them as well. So if you are interested in a certain location, you can manually add a, a hard line there. For the tubulars, you have the eight points at the crown, saddle, and then the midpoints between those. And then for the non-tubulars, you have these points. So when we did the hardline extraction, uh, those are the points that are generated. Those are also the uh, locations where you can define a stress concentration factor. So it's worth noting that if you add additional hard lines or if you do an all option when you do the SCF extraction, you are going to have to determine where you would like to put those SCFs in relation to 
the available options in the fatigue input. I said when I when I said that you were going to generate some additional input files when you did the joint mesh, uh, one of those input files is the OCI mesh. That's going to contain your model with the meshed plate elements. It's also going to include loading load cases that correspond to the nominal load cases for that brace. So whenever you mesh a joint for SCF extraction, it's now going to contain axial uh, out-of-plane bending and in-plane bending load cases for each brace that you've meshed for the SCF extraction. We also are going to generate a post input file for each brace that is meshed. And that post input file is going to have some new lines that may look unfamiliar. We have the SCF load case line that defines which brace is being extracted and then also what load cases correspond to that brace. Uh, e as I said, each brace is going to have its own set of load cases uh, for the nominal loading. And this is where those are de um, defined. Those are all generated automatically, so you don't really have to do any additional input. But if you want to modify these things to do something a bit different, this is an input file that can be opened in data gen and modified as you'd like. The other lines are the, let's see, the uh, SCF lines, which define uh, what uh, plates are going to be used to extract the SCF and also the distances away from the uh, connection. So this, def this defines for SACS how that SCF is extrapolated. We also have a new line called plate averaging, which will average the SCFs, or uh, sorry, not the SCFs, but average the stresses at the plate corners. Since you have four plates that connect, we want to make sure that we're averaging those plates so you get a, a consistent uh, SCF extraction. And one other thing that's worth noting is if you have a complex connection that is not easily uh, meshed automatically by the joint mesher, we do have all of this as input lines that you can do yourself. So you can create your own uh, meshes using Precede and your own post input files using uh, the data gen to generate your own SCF extraction input. It may take a bit more time, but that option is available. When post, uh, when we when we generate that post input file, then you're going to run a post analysis. So it'll be a basic static analysis with a mesh OCI file, and then the post input file. Um, each brace SCF extraction is run independently. The reason for this is that typically you want to change your boundary conditions for your connection um, for each brace because there are different fixities that you might need to consider. Uh, so each one is going to be run independently. When POST runs the analysis, it's going to generate the stresses at each plate and then do the calculations for those extrapolation plate uh, points based upon uh, DNV. So you can see here, we essentially take the uh, principal stresses and then we calculate the maximum principal stress, take that stress over the nominal stress that we calculate, and that will give us our stress concentration factor. And when we look at the results, it's possible to get an either a positive or negative stress concentration factor. That's because we retain the maximum stress uh, regardless of whether or not it is a positive or negative stress. After we run the post analysis, we get out a listing file that contains a table with all of the uh, stress concentration factor calculations. And it will see all of the plate stresses, membrane stresses, upper surface stresses, 
the calculated principal stress, the nominal stress, and then the calculated stress concentration factor. Whenever we get these stress concentration factors, of course, then we can go into the fatigue input file, enter in those stress concentration factors, and then run our fatigue analysis using that beam element model. Might be a bit hard to see right here, um, but we also generate a post view database with that static analysis where you can review the stress concentration factors graphically. If you go to the labeling options, when you have run a fatigue, uh, sorry, a SCF extraction analysis, there's a new tab that will be available in the labeling options where you have some different display options. We can now show you the hotspot stress, the nominal stress, and the SCF that's calculated at each location. And for those uh, locations, you can also pick the cord side, the brace side, and um, what load case that you want to look at. So uh, all of those options are available in that labeling options. And so uh, it can help to look at this graphically if you know you want to, instead of doing the output just for the hard lines and do it in the report, you can look at it graphically and maybe make an engineering judgment about which stress concentration factor you would actually like to use for your fatigue input. Like I said, once you've done this SCF extraction, you can then go into your fatigue input file and use any of the available stress concentration factor overrides for any given connection to put in the SACS SCF calculation, calculated uh, value and then run your fatigue analysis. So once you get those SCFs, the, the analysis will then look very much again like what we did before with our uh, spectral fatigue analysis. So that will look very much the same. It's really just getting those SCF values out of the SACS model file as opposed to doing this through the some sort of other FEA tool. And I wanted to talk a little bit about SN curves. I know that when we when we talk about the SCFs, you know, the SN curve is really kind of the other piece of the equation. Um, but I did want to reiterate that when we talk about SCFs, SCFs only account for really the geometry of the connection. So those plate elements that are connected, they don't really account for some other things like weld quality, not stress and weld improvements. So whenever we do this SCF calculation, this doesn't take care of those other uh, those other types of connections. So um, we rely upon these SN curves that are typically provided by different codes, which have different qualities of connections. Uh, specifically, this comes up a lot when we talk about uh, single-sided welds in the offshore industry, where you need to make sure that you're picking the correct SN curve when you take the root of the weld versus the weld toe. And so doing these SCF extractions will not uh, preclude you from having to, to make this consideration. And just as a reminder, here are some SN curves that SACS provides. So those are all available, and you can always do user-defined SN curves if the one you need is not available. So that concludes the tech talk for the uh, automatic SCF extraction. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm going to now hand it over to Raphael uh, to field any questions that you might have, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have some questions here. And the first one is, can I perform an SCF extraction using shell or solid elements? So that's a great question. Right now, 
we only use uh, plate elements. Um, most of the connections that we are considering are non-tubular connections or uh, you could also do this I suppose with tubular connections if you're interested um, even though we have F the mu as a, a, an alternative um, and those are really mostly thin walled elements uh, and as long as your so solid elements really aren't necessary because taking account we already take account of the SCF or sorry the stresses on the plate surface and we really don't need solid elements to account for the thickness uh, and about shells uh, as long as your mesh is fine enough uh, we um, plate elements should be just fine and we also do a check when we do our SCF extraction to make sure that the plate normals uh, are within a certain tolerance to make sure that we don't have any kind of weird um, averaging going on between you know plates that really shouldn't be considered the, in the same plane so we do take in, that into account when we do this analysis Here's another one. What is the input for the post view? Well, um, I'll I'll try and answer that. Um, I, I think there are two answers I can give, so I'll give both of them. Um, when you do your SCF extraction, you're going to do a joint mesh, which is is done in pre-seed. That's going to generate a mesh OC, OCI file, which is essentially a model file and a post input file for the brace. When you set up your static analysis then to do the SCF extraction you select the OCI file as your model file and then you need to select the post input file as your uh, as a, an additional post input. When you do that you it should automatically generate the post view database. If it doesn't then you need to select the uh, it's a option to generate uh, graphical results and then that will automatic after that automatically generate the post view database once you have that post view database and you open it up you can uh, then look at the um, then you can look at the SCF results by going to display labeling and then selecting the SCF tab to show that. Okay, we have one more. Is it possible to use quad mesh? Yes, when you mesh a connection, you can select uh, quadrilateral or triangular plates for the mesh and you can even select uh, those for particularly for the uh, per member for uh, per brace and I think there are a few different selection options as well that I might be forgetting so typically we recommend using triangular plates for tubulars to make sure that the mesh comes out nicely. Uh, it's some, it can be a bit difficult when you have uh, tubulars connecting to other tubulars to do a quadrilateral mesh, uh, especially around some of the, the coped portions of the connection. Uh, so, But yes, you do have the option to do either triangular or quadrilateral plates. Is negative SCF possible? Can you elaborate in what type of joint? Right, so that's a great question. And um, it, it has to do with how we calculate the stress concentration factor. And, you know, I, it's essentially what, what we do is we apply a nominal load to the uh, connection. And then we get a nominal stress from that. And then when we, uh, now that, that nominal stress can be a um, positive or negative value, then we also get a 
um, SCF, sorry, uh, when we do the principal stress calculation, that sign can change. And so uh, the value that you get there can be, it actually can change based upon whether or not that's a, that, that's a positive or negative value. So um, we've seen that, um, especially I think when we were doing the out-of-plane bending or in-plane bending calculations, we saw that you can get negative values out of that. It's, it functionally really doesn't matter um, as, I, I guess we could probably take the absolute value of that um, because really at the end of the day, the stress range is going to be the same. It's really more of, I would say, a semantic thing um, because, like I said, it, it really it really doesn't make too much of a difference whenever you're actually looking at the stress range itself. Um, so it, it's just kind of a function of how how those calculations are performed, it's, you know, nominal to principal, and then um, the principal stress can be a bit um, it can change sign there. Are these features covered and explained in the current manual? Or can we get a copy of your current presentation? So that is a really good question. Uh, this is going to be available in SACS 12, or 12? Yes, so SACS 12. So it should be out at the end of this month. Uh, I'm, you know, Obviously, that is subject to change, and the manual will be available uh, when we uh, re we release this. So, um, as far as the uh, presentation goes, this tech talk goes, I believe this will be made available. Uh, I'm going to defer to Natalie on that. If she has more information about that, she can certainly jump in. Um, but I believe these tech talks are made available. Uh, I know it's being recorded, so it should be available somewhere. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yes, all recordings will be sent to all registrants following the presentation, and it will be posted as well to Bentley.com. One more. Um, have you compared the extracted SCF values versus FTMU? Yes, we, we have done some comparisons, and... Um, We've seen pretty good results, although it's. I want to make sure that I'm clear about this: is the FMU calculations are essentially they're different. The FMU uh, parametric equations were generated from uh, real models. Well, I say real models. I believe they were uh, some sort of vinyl or you know uh, toy models, but. Um, but at the end of the day, they are also curve fits. Um, I did something similar in my thesis at UT, uh, and you the the one there's no real one-to-one -one correlation between an FEA uh, SCF extraction and parametric results. So, uh, especially depending upon the geometry, you can get uh, SCFs that don't quite match up between the FEA analysis and the parametric equation. So I would be careful about comparing those two directly. And in fact, I would take the FEA extraction results over the uh, parametric equation any day. Uh, I guess as long as you have a su sufficiently fine mesh, I will make that point that you want to make sure that you have a good mesh. Uh, if you have a bad mesh, then the SCF results will, uh, you can get bad SCF results. In current sex, how to add stiffness for the joints when they are non modular in the global model to extract the SCFs? Right, so, well, okay, uh, I think there, there may be some confusion when you're, when you do this mesh. So, so I, I know in the presentation I showed a model that just had a joint, but you can, I also showed one where you had a full structure, and you mesh the the connection in the structure. 
In that case, you are modeling the stiffness of the plates when you extract the SCF. The plates are all there, so the stiffness is there. Uh, there is no additional S, uh, uh, accounting for the stiffness of the joint there. Um, when you do, um, when you're modeling the structure without the mesh, uh, I, I have heard people ask about, okay, I have a you know non-tubular connection with ring stiffeners and plate stiffen, you know, uh, vertical stiffeners and all those sorts of things. So I have I have a much more rigid connection, right? Um, and so I want to model that stiffness. Um, there are a couple ways to do that. One way is to just go ahead and offset your beams to the face of the connection, right? That way you have, um, essentially you're saying that your connection is rigid. Um, you can ignore it and not have any stiffness of the connection. Um, and in reality, the, the true uh, answer is somewhere in between. Uh, I've seen some engineers do what they call like a haunch. Right, well, they'll model um, a segmented member and then they'll put in a, a wider beam element or something like that um, uh, to try and approximate the increased stiffness for the connection. Um, and any of those approaches is really um, valid. I, I tend to go with the offset uh, approach just to offset it away from the face and, and treat it as rigid. Although I, you know, I don't. When, when I was looking at the differences between those, I don't know if I saw really too much of a, a change in the results uh, that really uh, warranted worrying about it too much. Um, so, but, but those are the approaches that people would take. And I suppose if you really have a hoss of a machine, you could certainly model the every joint meshed. It will take a long, long time to analyze though. <laughs> Principal stress perpendicular or within 45 degrees of weld line is generally taken for calculation. Your method is more conservative. Is the nominal stress calculated at the intended hot spot by beam elements using the point location? Right, let me jump back to that slide because. Um, here. I may not have explained this. Yeah, I, I didn't I don't think I mentioned that these uh these directions are relative to the um we we actually draw these lines out perpendicular to the connection. So uh and the sigma x and sigma y are essentially since the plates are drawn out perpendicular to that connection, the X and Ys are, uh, in fact, per, you know, perpendicular to the connection and parallel to the connection. Uh, so when we do our principal stresses, uh, they, are, um, they are relative to the connection. Uh, so I, I think, I hope that answers that question. Um, I, and I, that is how DNV does it. Uh, I believe so. Uh, if there's, if I'm not answering that co correctly, please uh, re rephrase it because I want to make sure that I'm answering that correctly. Can SACs be used on subsea pipelines for fatigue calculations? That's not something I've heard uh, SACs used for before. Um, but I don't. I don't know why it wouldn't be used for that. Um, I imagine there's some things with subsea pipelines that we don't model, um, like the boundary conditions I think might be difficult to model in SACs. Um, however, um, once you have the, the, as far as the tubulars are concerned and the fatigue calculations, as long as you get the loading in, I imagine it would be okay um, but I would say that's probably uh, probably not the right way to go um, 
I can follow up with you on that. I can do a little bit more research and, and get an answer back to you, though, um, about that. Hey, Jeff, coming back to the question you answered before, he's asking again, and one of the two principal is to be used, non-maximum stress in the two per DNV or ABS recommendation. Oh, okay, yeah, I see what he's saying is that you use the max. I believe that's how DNV says that you're supposed to do that. I think there are three options where you look at the the SCF due to the principal stress in one direction, the principal stress in the other direction, and then the max. Um, I could be wrong about that, uh, but I believe that's how it's done. So... Um, if I if I am uh, stating that incorrectly, then um, it, then it is conservative. I don't. I I think this is right though. So yeah. Um, but in any case, yeah. If if anything, it is conservative because we are taking the max of the absolute value of the the principal stresses. Ocean current in offshore does not generate fatigue or considered as a steady state load? Right, we consider current as a steady state load uh, in, in SACS. Uh, when you do your wave response, if you have a wave load, the current can amplify your wave response, uh, but we don't, we don't really take a current variation in account. Uh, if you wanted to do something like that, uh, we would probably have to do it using some sort of time history uh, analysis or a deterministic uh, analysis where you would take different currents, uh, get, the, get the current loading on the structure for you know, different current speeds, and then generate a fatigue based upon that, either, like I said, either through a time history analysis or through deterministic where you essentially just say, I want so many cycles of the, the difference between these two currents or, you know, a set of currents. Uh, that's how I would, I would imagine you would want to do that. We really, um, we do the spectral analysis with the wave fatigue because that uh, we can keep everything in the frequency domain and you can capture essentially all of the wave energy when you do that. Um, I don't think that we typically worry too much about the current fatigue, though. We usually just use the max. And what about offshore wind on above structure, surface structures? Oh, wind, offshore wind on above surface structures. Well, we have a, a wind fatigue uh, utility, which allows you to combine the wind response on the turbine with the uh, wind wave and current loading on the substructure. And uh, there are a variety of different options with that. We can do uncoupled with essentially a time history input. Uh, we can do uh, coupled analyses with fast and GH bladed. Uh, and all of those are essentially the same where you do a uh, combination of the, like I said, the wind response with the wind, wave, and current responses on the substructure. Uh, as far as the SCF extraction goes, um, I don't, I mean, I don't know what you would be extracting for the wind turbine. Uh, it's essentially just a tower, and as far as the equipment goes, I we don't we don't touch the turbine equipment. So if you're trying to get like an SCF or the wind turbine or something like that, I don't think that you would be able to do that. I imagine that those turbines probably have some specs in in them on you know uh, maintenance curves and things like that that probably would be more applicable. Uh, but yes, if you're doing wind turbines, that that would be the way to go uh, and. Uh, we've made some presentations before. I think you can find some content on Bentley.com uh, where we talk about how to do wind turbine uh, design. 
we actually just had the Block Island um, project off uh, east coast of the U.S., which is the first North American wind turbine uh, project. They've just, I, I don't know, they're in the middle of installing all of that, I believe. I don't know if they've finished yet, um, but that was all designed using SACS. Have you verified your results against the DNV verification models? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know which verification models you're talking about. Uh, I would be very much interested in seeing them uh, so that we could look at them. I, I, we've done a lot of testing on this uh, from the uh, just verifying the plate elements. Uh, which we actually have some uh, some content online shows the verification of the plate elements. We've done verification of the SCF extraction method itself, uh, but I'm not aware of any DNB benchmarks. So if you if you have something, uh, I'd love to see it. I will contact you about that.